Okay, amazing. Hi, Tad. Excited hello, hello. Um, to put the questions from the Marketing for Hippies Facebook group to you today. We've got quite yes. a few, which is great. So the first one from Alexandra Derwen, she says, I'm happy to do marketing, but it feels like a lot of effort for little yield. I'd like to know where the levers are, where the right amount of effort brings a bigger yield. That's a great question. Right. This is a very frustrating thing for a lot of people is uh, I've heard people say it just feels like you're flushing money down the toilet. It's just nothing comes of it. Uh, it just seems like such a waste to spend all this money on a Facebook ad. Nothing comes. And yeah, you put up posters. Nobody responds to it. So there are, um, I would say, five five levers that we're looking at. Um, and if people go to marketingforhippies.com slash steps, you'll see these laid out. The very first lever, though it may seem um, only obliquely related, but I say it's very directly related, is the ethical question. That one of the reasons so much marketing fails is because it's so high pressure, because it's so unethical, and people lean back from it. People mistrust it. So even if you have your niche, you've got all the strategic stuff figured out. If it's pushy and aggressive and manipulative, I think this ultimately, it works in the short term uh, sometimes, but it backfires in the long term. So that's that's one lever, is making sure our attention is really squarely focused on this, getting to the truth of is it a fit and supporting them and figuring out if it's a fit for them uh, instead of trying to get the sale. That's the first thing. Second lever is niching. Uh, one of that's this is probably I mean each one of these is like ninety percent of it, and then of the ten percent that remain, ninety percent of the what's left over from the ethics is niching. And um, because trying to be everything to everybody doesn't work, and this is often what's happening, though people aren't aware of it, is they are um, they're if they make a product, they make a very generic product, or they make all kinds products and they don't have any kind of specialization in anything they're known for or if they have a service it's like oh get in my boat i can take you to any island and that um is almost always it when i get you know people book me for a puttering session 90 percent of the time it's the niche thing uh, people are struggling with that so uh, literally just the shift from i'm trying to reach everybody to here's an offer for this particular group or here's this very specific style of product will immediately get a much more uh, polarized response, meaning uh, more no's, but also a lot more yeses. Third lever is the point of view piece, uh, because you may not be the only one that's taking people from island A to island B. You may not be the only one making a certain product, but you might be the only one doing that with a certain philosophy, with a certain approach, a certain perspective. Um, yeah. And, and uh, so the lack of articulation around point of view often has people so... Uh, Mistrusting, I guess. They just, why would you be credible? Why would I trust you at all? Uh, number four is the business model piece. Because sometimes it's not that the marketing isn't working. It's a, it's a profitability question. Uh, and sometimes it's, no, the marketing isn't working, but why is that marketing not working? Because you're trying to sell this really expensive thing and it's not safe enough yet. You know, there's no, uh, if an ice cream shop only sold huge like 10 gallon things of ice cream they wouldn't sell anything if a yoga studio only tried to do teacher trainings they wouldn't sell any um you have to make it easy for people to get to know you so this is the pink spoons the free samples the the tasters of what you do so this could be video audio written quizzes and assessments things that help people get to know you without you even knowing they're doing it you know online safely from a distance they can check you out uh, and of course reputation long term plays a role in that and then the fifth lever is what i call hub hub marketing and one of the reasons a lot of these things fail is you got the ethics you figured out your niche you got your point of view you got some really easy uh, offers but then you're reaching out to people cold and they don't know who you are and because they don't know who you are um they're less likely to open the email. I mean, the number one reason an email gets open has nothing to do, well, it's not the subject line, it's who it's from. If you get an email from somebody you love and trust, you open that email, um, even if the subject line is confusing. But if you get a, 
an email with a confusing subject line from somebody you don't know, you won't. But even an email from somebody you don't know with a clear subject line, well, who knows? Could be spam. I don't know. We just deprioritize it. So people hearing about things from people they trust, that um, makes a big difference. The exact same sales letter, the exact same email, the exact same um, social media post coming from somebody who they trust will have 10 times the response to your own stuff from your own uh, medium when you're trying to reach new people. So those are the five levers I'd be looking at um, of, of where is it going wrong? Uh, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Um, hopefully so, you that... know, if, I, if, I, if I had to give one more lever, <laughs> just another way to look at it, three or just one because sometimes like oh you're just you reached what 10 people and you got one response that's actually amazing uh, but are you reaching enough people number two are you filtering properly is it clear is the relevance very clearly established up front who it's for who it's not for again that's the niching trying to be everything to everybody but the third role of marketing is to lower the risk of taking the next step which you hear spoken of in the um, business model the pink spoons but also in the hub marketing just as an organizing principle, and if you go to marketingforhippies.com slash risk, you'll see a, an article about this that's fairly robust. Um, sometimes people do everything right, but then people look at the offer. They're, they're saying yes to it. They want it, but it's too scary. It's too risky. Uh, and so they don't. And so we have to find ways to identify what those risks are and lower them. And there's three ways to reduce risk, which are in the article. Amazing. Thank you. Ted, um, I hope that helps Alexandra. <laughs> um, okay, next question is from Elena Pu. I'm sorry about your surname, but I'll try my best. Elena Puoin Iniemi, <laughs> yeah. and she says, "I'm stuck with crickets. It's just no fun to shout out stuff for no response." I can live with it, but it feels like there's no sense in keeping showing up and spending time on social media. Yeah, well, very similar question uh, to the last one. Yeah, uh, you put stuff out, right? There's crickets. The to me, the big thing would be, well, yeah, who are you trying to reach? Who are you putting it out to? And again, that's usually uh, pretty vague. So maybe we'll just include those two in the one answer. Yeah, amazing. Um, okay, next question is from Sandra Zamorano. <laughs> Actually, she's saying she feels exactly the same. Hang on, bear with me. Okay, next one from Annie. So that was for Sandra as well. <laughs> uh, next one's from Annie Barber. I'd like to be more imaginative slash creative with my marketing. I find it takes me ages to create something that really speaks my message to my people. Uh huh. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. and then, sorry, sorry, Ted, just to interrupt, you, you actually asked her to clarify. You said, what sorts of things are you wanting to create? And she said, posts for social media, getting seen, being useful and expanding my following. Okay. Here's my usual go-to advice in terms of being uh, creative. Well, there's two things. There's one, the three C's, and then there's the stories. So the three C's, we often put too much pressure on ourselves to be creative. So there's three C's of social media. With uh, social media posts and emails, there's stuff we create, there's stuff we curate, and then there's ways we conversate in conversations. So the stuff you create is your own videos, your own memes, your own articles, your own you know, reels, all of that. And people tend to think that's the only thing that they can do on social media is put out their own original content, uh, but that's not true. Because the second thing you can do is you can curate. You can find stuff from other people and share that. Um, on my you know, Instagram, I don't know, I like sharing fun memes and meaningful mm -hmm. memes. And so I do a theme Thursday, I do a meme Monday. And so that's curated. I don't, that's none of my stuff. Those are not my ideas. I just share other people's thoughts. Uh, 
And then the third is you can conversate. You can just start conversations with people. And this often gets way more engagement than the first two. You can just ask a meaningful question. So that's the first thing I'd say is to take some of the pressure off that first C of creating everything yourself. Um, the second piece, though, is about stories. And this is the easiest way to get social media content. Schedule five minutes every day to reflect on the last 24 hours and ask yourself, is there a story? Is there something that happened in the last 24 hours that's a good illustration of what I'm on about? And there almost always is. And it could be something you read, could be uh, you went out shopping, you went for a walk, you saw something. Almost certainly it'll be you talked to a client, something came up in that interaction that you thought would be useful for other people. Sharing those stories in quick little videos or you just type it up um, is huge. Uh, and this is an easy way to get content. I think we t we try to be so original, and I would sort of give up that racket. Don't don't be original. Be obvious. You know, just say the thing. And I guess the third thing would be, people tend to the the creativity looks like ah, I have to sit down at my laptop and just come up with something in the moment, which I never do. I mean, this is just uh, it's impossible. So have a system to capture. Have a place where you can put ideas, and those ideas. Once you uh, have them down, you just collect them. Yeah, you have a place to, so this could be a notebook in your back pocket. Every stand up comedian who's professional has that uh, or note on their phone, but they have a place when they have an idea, they write it down and then they forget about it. When they come uh, to the time where they want to work on their new act, they go back to it. So, similarly, don't try to come up with social media stuff in the moment. Be collecting it as you go because you have ideas, you're, you're sitting on the tube. You're um, stuck in traffic. An idea occurs to you. You're about to fall asleep. You have an idea. Write it down and then forget about it. And just make sure you schedule some time in fairly regularly to go back once a month, once a quarter, to go back through there and start to pull out the stuff you want to do. Yeah, amazing. I love that. I think that's such a useful and helpful thing. Um, thanks, Ted. Hopefully that helps, Annie. Um Okay, next question is from, again, about social media. This is from Debbie Allardyce. Allard, yeah, Allard, Allardyce, I think. <laughs> uh, she says, I have an obstacle around social media. How do you turn social media into something you enjoy? I think you've touched on that a little bit. But she also says, how do you make it authentic and not forced or contrived? When time is limited, I don't want to spend it on something that doesn't feel good. Mm. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, how to make it authentic, I don't know. Um, it's, I think, just the, in well, oh, this is a funny one. Just the intention to be authentic can be helpful, but it can also be harmful because we put so much pressure on it. It's like, oh my God, I have to be so authentic right now. And, 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 but the agenda to be authentic can make us inauthentic. You know, it's like, oh, I just have to be so present. And, and you see this all the time in the new age scene when people are sitting in circles or talking. It's a, people are trying to be authentic instead of being authentic. So, um, instead of this agenda to be authentic, which often translates as my desire to be seen as authentic, which is another form of taking from people, I would just keep our agenda uh, about the truth. Like, let me just get to the truth of, let me just share the truth of what I know. Let me just share my opinion candidly. Let me give people the information they need to decide if it's a fit. And then they're going to do what they do. And yeah, in terms of not enjoying it, part of this is one, you got to figure out the right mix of stuff. Well, number one, you don't have to do social media. I mean, just to take that burden off everyone, it's not required. You can absolutely grow a business very quickly with no social media at all, mostly with this hub, hub marketing approach that I'm talking about. Uh, so you can do that, and that's just fine. If you're going to do it, it's good to figure out how you want to do it. Um, and at one resource of Rebecca Van Dam, uh, last name V-A-N-D-A-M-M, -M, uh, as in Mary.com. Uh, she's amazing at helping people figure out the right strategy and the right mix. But one thing I recommend is spend an hour just scrolling around social media on the accounts that you do follow, that you do like, 
and notice what you like about them. And then you come up with your own thing. Um, Cause we don't have to be on it all the time at all. But we might just say, okay, I want to post uh, once a day, five days a week. So I'm gonna do five posts every week. And I think on Mondays, I'll do this kind of post. Tuesdays, I'll do this kind of post. So I think sometimes we just don't think about it. And again, we sit down with a blank page and just think, what am I going to do that's really authentic and useful and meaningful? Just tabula rasa. And that's very difficult. Instead, if you come up with some sequence, and like once a month, I post this kind of thing. Once a quarter, I post this kind of thing. Uh, that's helpful. And if you keep in mind the 10 to 1 ratio, 10 units of like cool, interesting content, and then one shameless plug. 10 cool, useful things, one shameless plug is a helpful general ratio. Um, and, you know, then there's also figuring out schedule wise, when do you want to do this? But certainly there's no need to like pull out a phone, you know, every time you're having a authentic moment to share that on online. Um, you know, people are often curious and every once in a while, but this is also the kind of thing you can think about, you know, once a month or once a week, you can sit down and say, okay, what's coming up in the next week that might make a good little personal thing. Like, oh, I'm going to this sleigh ride. Maybe I'll do that. I'll take a photo of that and I'll put that up and I've got some things to say about that. Or we're going to be having a bonfire, you know, that'd be nice. So you can think ahead of, and then that's the one you do instead of all the time, just like what can I capture that's going to show people how cool my life is. Amazing. Thanks, um, Ted. I love that that the scheduling, taking time to schedule these things and, and um, planning ahead. It's, yeah. it's such a game changer for people uh, because we're so reactive in business. And this is what hurts most of us as entrepreneurs is we're so reactive we're always trying to improvise in the moment mm -hmm. rather than having a plan i mean it's a it's a revolutionary idea for most of the hippies that i work with to have a plan mm -hmm. i mean when you're launching an event to have a plan for that if you have social media to actually have a plan and a structure for that um and the structure is so liberating ironically mm -hmm. yeah right and uh the other thing that came to mind for me just to mention for in case it's helpful for Debbie is also about the different I like how you do different types of posts you know you've got yeah. video you know d what can you say a little bit more about when you might post a three minute video or when you, when you might post a longer one or when you might just post a bit of text yeah, well, we have this all mapped out. I mean, this, there's a whole schedule that I've got in terms of, I can't even hear, I'll just do a little screen share because I can pull this up quick and, and show uh, just what this looks like because I think sometimes it's um, a little uh, nebulous or hard to grasp. So uh, all right, I'm going to do a screen share. Uh, oh, you got to enable my... Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, Ted. So what you're going to see is a little spreadsheet of what's posted every week, every month, every quarter on social media. Sure. And, uh, so this is, so I don't do my own social media. I've hired somebody to do it at this point. And, but this is the plan that we've come up with together. So, okay. So you'll see weekly, here's the plan. So uh, these are the weeks, you know, December 19th, December 26th, January 2nd, etc. And then you can see, um, what goes uh, when and the um, this kind of goes from early in the month towards later in the month or this is sorry this is weekly so this is all the monday stuff these are all things to do on monday these are all things that she does on tuesday wednesday and yeah you'll see a bunch of different things some of them are um, posts like little memes some of them are uh, you know, single image, some of them are carousel with multiple images with text, some of them are videos, some of them are content that I've created, some of them is just uh, funny stuff I found, some of it is also just a shameless plug for what I do. And then on the monthly level, you'll see this as well. And so you can see we've divided this up in the beginning of the month, the middle of the month, the end of the month as a way to do it. And so this gets checked off when she does it, boom, she checks it off as a way of uh, keeping track. And so actually I'll just delete this comment here. Um, 
yeah, so that's the monthly and then quarterly. Um, there's not as much. There's just a couple things to do once a quarter. Yeah, that, that is amazing. Thank you for showing us that. I hope that's helpful, Debbie, and everyone else. <laughs> and you'll notice that these are linked, right? Post a membership testimonial. Well, where do you find the membership testimonials that's already linked to my membership sales letter? So she can go there, grab the testimonial, etc. So this is very key, especially if you're hiring somebody to do this, which, you know, uh, for certain people to get to that point. Um, is you want everything linked so it's just very easy for them to find and also if somebody comes into that job it's all there you don't have to go tell them every single time where to find the thing um, ideally every one of these would probably be linked to something and some of them have little instructions you can see in the little corner there's a little note um, and um, similar here theme thursday here's the google folder of all the memes here's the point of view facebook you know it's all there so um this is just something, you know, first you may do it on your own, but as you're doing it on your own, be developing this because eventually then it, you can pass it on to somebody. If you don't have a plan or a structure or a system like this, you absolutely can't pass anything on to anybody. Or you'll be micromanaging them, which they will hate and you will hate. Uh, or they'll just do, they'll make a dog's breakfast or the whole thing and they'll do what they want to do and uh, not what needs to be done. So. I'm glad, I'm glad that the question was asked. And thanks, uh, Betty, for following up on it. Yeah, well, I'm so happy that you asked that, Debbie, because I hadn't seen that before. And that was just so, so interesting. I hope, I imagine that you all agree. Um, so thanks for that, Ted. So the next question then is from Lise Lily Wild. Um, and she says, I'm transitioning from major health issues back into life beyond. I find that I can no longer travel extensively with my work due to health, which means I've lost a lot of my client base. I have ideas on how to reinvent what I do. However, that takes time. What would you suggest? Focusing my limited energy, energy on looking for part-time work or forging ahead with revamping myself? I guess it's a question around realistic energy expenditure for those of us in similar situations with health or gaps in work i.e mums etc i okay right big question right so if you're in a place in your life whether due to illness or family circumstance um or something traumatic happened and you just have very little bandwidth you've only got an hour or two of ability to really you know focus on anything new every day what do you do well first of all getting a job is a great idea if there's some job that's fairly easy to do, that doesn't ask a lot of you, but is going to sustain you, I would urge most people to, uh, if, if it's in the early days, to jump on that. Because it takes about three years to build it up. Let's just have that in mind. Three years if you're if you're starting something or restarting. Now, if you're restarting, it might be a little bit faster because you've got a lot of experience and contacts, connections you can bring to bear. But let's just have that as a general time frame. So then having a job in those early days to sustain you to pay the bills is, I think, very wise. Uh, and then the business is a side hustle, which you which you slowly build up. But the other thing I would say is, and there's a, a blog post called uh, marketingforhippies.com slash four dash stages. And that's the four stages of business growth. And it's just worth for everyone to take a look at where are you in those stages? Because to, to get from stage one to stage three really solidly, that's the three year journey. And then to get to stage four, it's probably a number of years beyond that. Um, but then it also makes me think that, you know, when we don't have a lot of time to mess around, uh, or let's just say you're 65 and you wanna retire from your business in five years, okay, you don't have much time to mess around. So what you gotta do is focus. That is when an insane level of, of niching and focus is required. You just cannot uh, any longer try to be everything to everybody. The advantage, at least, of having uh, so many years under your belt is you've got a lot to harvest from. And so in terms of niching, if people go to marketingforhippies.com slash puttering dash prep, P-U-T-T-E-R-I-N-G dash, or no, it's just P-R-E-P, -E there's no dash, uh, puttering prep, you'll find my favorite best exercise around niching. It's free for now. I may start charging for this at some point, but it's currently free. And I would dig in. I would just 
relentlessly niche down to something very specific. It also depends if you want to do this online or locally. If you're going to go online, you niche even further. You get so specific, like here's something that nobody else is doing or that very few people are doing, reaching a crowd that nobody's reaching, doing something in a way that nobody's doing yet. You really hone in. You can also search on YouTube, Tad Hargrave Positioning Matrix. There's a conversation I had with Danny Innie about this thing called the Positioning Matrix, which is very helpful for, for narrowing down. Uh, and if you're working locally, then you can't probably go quite as narrow, uh, but still the same principle applies like, okay, what's missing here? That's the operating question. What's missing? What's nobody doing? What's the way that nobody's doing it? And we really focus in on that because, um, and then even if it's the same niche, okay, a lot of people are reaching this niche, but could I come up with an offer that's unique, that's different, that's missing? You know, there's a, not just uh, the what is missing, but maybe the how has been missing. Nobody's done it in this way. And you've got to really focus in on something. Uh, because if you try to be everything to everybody, it's just, that is guaranteed to fail. Now, narrowing it on a niche, that still might fail. That's certainly possible, but that's way less likely to fail. And if it does, you'll know faster. You'll know pretty quick. Um if that niche is going to work or not. And, you know, if you're trying to pick the niche, if it's not immediately clear, maybe you say, I've got five, I don't know what to do. Do five very tiny tests, like five workshops in your living room, five 90 minute free calls. You do a poll as a test. Hey, I've got these five things. What does everybody think? Get feedback quickly. Just iterate, have a lot of conversations with people until you find something that really, uh, that really lands, that feels good for you and that you think has a good chance in the market. Okay, thanks, Ted. Um, a, a question popped up for me while you were saying that, which was around, um, I'm not sure if this will be relevant to Lise, but hopefully for somebody listening, um, uh, when you are, when you have been serving a very broad audience, very client base, um, and then you niche down and then how do you manage that in terms of like yeah telling everybody or lo potentially losing people yeah um okay right i mean it's one thing i'm realizing i don't know is how well niched uh, lisa is she may already have a, a perfectly good niche and is just struggling to, to launch in the local place and least if that's the case please ask a question for next month's uh thing but let's, yeah, let's say you've been just kind of reaching everybody. You decide, no, I want to work with the single women in their 20s, helping them with dating, you know, in their, their dating flows. But you had women in their 60s and you had men and you had, you were helping them with all sorts of things, but now you've, you've gotten very narrow. I do recommend, I think, emailing your list and saying, hey, everybody, I'm changing focus and I could use your help. First of all, if this is of interest, I'd love to work with you. But if not, maybe you know somebody. And here's a cut and paste something you can share on social media. And here's an image to go with it. Or here's a post I've already put on social media. You can go tag your friends there. You know, we, we can um, enlist their help. And hey, does anyone know anyone I should talk to? Any good hubs, any connections where I could reach people like this? So you, those people love you. And they're probably going to be happy to help you. Um, and also, if you're if you decide to go local, you can reach out to all your past clients. Say, hey, I've really you know I'm in Hamburg and I'm just doing my work locally here. Does anyone know anybody in Hamburg? So that your existing clients could still be of immense uh, support to you, uh, even if you're not working with them uh, online or in that locale anymore. People know people in other places. That's a really great point. I love that. Thanks. Okay, next question from Dana. Dana. Sorry, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Wilson. Um, she would like some guidance on learning Instagram specifically. And she says she can't find any Facebook groups or trainings to help. Oh, man, if you want to learn Instagram, just go onto YouTube and type, how do I use Instagram? And there's free videos galore. But also, if you go check out George Cow's website, so georgekao.com, and search under his offerings. He has a course on Instagram basics and how to use it, uh, which is really solid and very affordable. 
And then if you're looking at how do you develop a strategy uh, with somebody who's an ex expert in Instagram, Rebecca Van Dam, again, Rebecca, V-A-N-D-A-M-M -M, uh, com. She's really brilliant at that. Um, but there's a ton. Oh, and here's the best resource of all. There are teenagers in your life who can just sit you down and show you. I'm partly joking, but I'm also partly deadly serious about that. Like there's some somebody in their late teens, early 20s, who is a complete whiz at Instagram. And you can just say, look, can I buy you pizza, take you out for dinner, pay you 50 bucks or whatever, just sit down with me for two hours and walk me through this and teach me? Because they will. They're they're smarter than you might ever be. And uh, they'd probably be happy to help you. So, Yeah, yeah I love that. Amazing. And um... or, or let me just say this, or <laughs> not a teenager, you just post on Facebook and you say, hey, everybody, yeah. I want to learn Instagram. Is anybody a whiz who'd be willing to go for lunch with me? Like I'll, I'll buy a lunch, but just two hours to just teach me the basics because I feel like I'm drowning with this and totally overwhelmed. You probably have a friend who will help you as well. Amazing. So good to just ask, isn't it? <laughs> we forget to do that sometimes. Um, okay. Next question is from Lee Hampson. And he says he is interested in a simple automated email sequence and pixel retargeting, please. And then the next thing is simple tips on fostering a customer relationship and a soft close would be great to learn too. Okay, let's break that apart. So the first, what was the very first thing? The first part, I'm interested in a simple automated email sequence and pixel retargeting, please. Okay. So I would recommend checking out conversionengineering.co. Um, lovely fellow named Ross from Ireland. And he's got a lot to say on the technical side. I know basically nothing about um, those things. Uh, and he could help you figure out that kind of sequence. What was the next part? Um. So that was the email sequence and the pixel retargeting. Is that? Yeah, that's also same, that. That's part of that. Um, so simple tips on fostering a customer relationship and a soft close. Uh, right. How do you build the relationship? Um, and then how does that transition into them working with you or not? Boy, this is very context specific. It's hard to, I, I can give the general sense, but you could imagine this translates completely differently if it's live and in person or if it's online. Uh, if we're looking at automating this or we're looking at real conversations with people. So there, there, there are a number of ways this could go. First of all, just having the pink spoons, the free content out there, this is one of the ways that we foster a relationship. That's one of the, the, uh, the number of people I've had is, oh, I've been following you for years and watched a bunch of your YouTubes, and now I just signed up for this more expensive thing uh, because it felt like it was time. And all I did was send out an email saying, hey, here's this thing that's happening. So uh, that's that's a lot of it is just the um, that. But a live in-person version of that could be that you do a monthly um, talk. You know, and it could be your, kind of what I call your intro workshop where once a month you just do a talk or you could do a talk on a slightly different topic. If you're, let's say, a naturopath, you just do a talk on a different uh, condition. But if that's probably still also, there's going to be the top 12, you know, issues that just everybody comes with. You know, so you got your cancer, you got your heart disease, you got your digestion, you got your blood sugar, whatever. Um, so you could do that. You could also have a local meetup group where you get everyone together and then you take 20 minutes to do a little talk and people gather and hang out and mingle. Um, and, you know, so an example of that is you do the meetup group and they say, hey, I've also got an intro workshop and that's it, the public pays, but it's free for you. And then they come to that and that's free for them as well. And then you offer whatever the package is the next step. Um, and that can be very low key. I mean, the whole question of how do we do the pitch um, is an entire, uh, boy, that's a whole conversation because it's also different if you're at the front of the room versus if it's email versus if it's a phone conversation. So uh, maybe what would help is next time if you can come back with uh, specifics of what's the context that you're in where you're trying to do this, the the, uh, the soft sell, the, the low pressure thing. Um, but generally the principle is this. Number one, it's got to be relevant. Yeah, it's got to be a very targeted focus, something. Either the product is a very specific kind of product 
or the journey that you're taking them on is a very specific kind of journey. Assuming that, then that's like, um, you know, I got a book here and uh, the front cover of the book, that's the relevance, the back cover, that's the credibility. And then this is the oh wait, relevance <laughs> value is the back cover and credibility is the middle. So that's the point of view. So people have a misdirected drive. They put all this effort into thinking, how do I do the close? How do I do the pitch? How do I convert people? Uh, and then they spend like a third of their workshop on that. I saw a, a busker and I he was very successful, Nick Nicholas from Australia. And I said, what, what do you think are the biggest mistake that um, street performers make with their hat pitch, like at the end? When they, you know. He says, it's too much. It's too long. And he said, you notice in my show, at the end, all he does is, ladies and gentlemen, this is my hat. This is my heart. This is my art. You know what to do. And then he steps back. But a lot of them do a bunch of jokes and it's just, so, it's a torrent of material right at the end. But what he does is throughout the show, he just seeds the amount that he wants them to give. He's like, yeah, I did this trick the other day and this, um, this old woman came up to me and she put $10 in my hat and said, that was the best thing I've seen. And I'll, you know, just put a big smile on her face. Just thought I'd point that out. You know, So he's letting people know $10 is the amount to pay in a cheeky, funny way. Uh, so when it gets to the end, he doesn't need to belabor the point that's already been mentioned. So the people put too much weight on the pitch. And it's just a, a camping chair. It's not designed to carry a lot of weight. You don't sit an elephant in a camping chair. It's just for a human, you know. And so most of it is in the point of view. Most of it is in building credibility. A little bit in the relevance, a little bit in the value. That's where we talk about the product or service. Most of it is credibility building. And that's just letting them get to know you and also sharing very fully your point of view, your perspective, your take on things. And key to the soft sales, when we get to the pitch, it's a flat affect. You know, when I'm talking about my point of view, I'm enthusiastic. I got, I'm smiling. I got facial expressions. But when it gets to the pitch, it's just logistics. Because any enthusiasm at that point will read as pressure. Yeah. Any like, oh, and you should do, it's going to be so great. Now that's pressure. So when it gets to this, it's just, okay. And so here's the details. It's a six week thing. And uh, we meet once a week and, you know, and then it's, it's kind of just over to them. And of course, if we want to reduce the pressure, um, well, I mean, if there's real scarcity, there's only a certain number of spots we tell them, but we don't manufacture it. We don't say, Hey, if you sign up, you know, now, then, um, you know, if you don't sign up now, you'll be a wretched failure forever. We, we don't do that. Um, yeah, those are the thoughts that come to me. Beautiful. Thank you, Ted. Um, so the next question is from Esther Dry. And she says, she asks, how do I attract, direct, and broadcast my service-led business without being overwhelming she says i want to create concise accessible language sometimes i feel like i miss out important or unique aspects of the service i have and i asked her what her business was and she said it's a bespoke home reorganization service I'm not sure I felt that she's just not wanting to like be too wordy in her marketing, is it? Yeah. So she says, how do I attract, direct, broadcast my service-led led business, so the home reorganization service, without being overwhelming? Okay. Right. How do I market it, basically, without being overwhelming? Um. Well, oh yeah, part of it again, 10 units of cool content to one unit of pitching. That's part of it is just that not everything is a pitch all the time. Um, what else to say? Um, if you're emailing your list, if you have an email list, you know, don't send a really long email every day. I mean, the question of how frequently and what to email our list is everyone has different opinions about, but I think what we can all agree on is if you send a huge email every day, people will unsubscribe. 
So, but if it's a very short email, like a, it's just a paragraph, which Seth Godin does, just a thought, you can do that every day, easy. And people are really happy to receive it. So there's something about length, um, you know, and and uh, the brevity of it and, and frequency. So there's that. But also the more narrow the niche, the more willing people are to get more communication about it. If it's exactly what they need, they're going to have a bit more bandwidth for content than if it's they have to sift through and find the thing that's relevant for them. Uh, that's a way not to overwhelm. And then, of course, on social media, it's just not just posting 20 times a day of buy from me, buy from me, buy from me. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know how often do we post. I've talked with somebody like Rebecca Van Dam about that. But let's imagine you post two or three times a day at the most. And again, most of that is cool, interesting content that you curate, that you create, or conversations that you engage. But that's all the kind of cold approach, yeah? Um, but that's not where I'd put most of the effort in marketing. And this is, I think, where we people spin out is they think, how do I do the cold approach of approaching total strangers in a way that doesn't overwhelm them or me? But that's just a hard approach because these people don't know you and there's a lot of work uh, on your end and you have to approach a lot of people. And anyways, much better is the, the uh, warm or the hot approach. So the warm approach is you think, okay, who am I trying to reach? And then where do I find them? Who are the hubs? And I build relationships with those hubs and they connect with those people. <clears throat> and now those people are on your list uh, and they're already warm or now they buy from you. And then the hot approach is that you become a hub and you just end up getting word of mouth, which is when it's just not overwhelming for anybody because now you just have a reputation and a waiting list and people want to get in to see you. You know, it's like my puttering sessions. Nobody's getting overwhelmed with my pr promo for my one-on-one -on -one puttering sessions. Um, you know, if you go to marketingfrapies.com slash puttering, there's a waiting list you can get on. But my uh, pro members get the first heads well there's a cancellation list of people who are just desperate usually get the first heads up then it's my pro members then it's um the foundations members then it's the waiting list and then we often will go back to the pro members foundation members waiting list one more time and then to my whole list of you know of twelve thousand people or whatever it hasn't gotten to the whole list in almost forever. I put it as a PS accidentally in, one, in that email a couple of months ago and they, it's just, oops, sold out right away. So um, this is how you don't overwhelm. You know, you build the list, you build the following, you build a, a waiting list where people are just waiting to get in and then you don't need to do as much marketing. Yeah. Uh, Ted, I wonder if it might be interesting for people if you say a few words about your puttering sessions because certainly in Britain I didn't know what a puttering meant <laughs> I had to look it up yeah so a puttering session and this is something that could be of use to people to come up with their own version I've certainly had a lot of people t tell me they've come up with their own um, so puttering means pottering in the UK uh, it just means you're futzing about you're fiddling you're tidying cleaning up you know just picking up this doing that um, wiping down, dusting, sweeping, that kind of thing. And so I book these sessions, they're an hour long and it's 200 US for the hour, uh, for, for members only 150 for the hour. And the um, during that time I'm puttering around my house or I go for a walk. And so I've had people, they work on their game, their putting game. So there's the putting sessions, not puttering. Um, people who are in the kitchen and they're cooking and preparing stuff because they have a food-based business and they don't have enough time to actually be in the kitchen because they're marketing their business so much. People yeah, go on walks in the redwoods, people go on longer hikes, people do it while gardening, like live with people. So you can combine the coaching you do with something else you'd like to be doing. Um, and for me, it was tidy because I just, I'm, I'm such a wreck if my home gets messy and I deeply resent tidying. So this is a way I could combine them and and uh, be paid, be paid to tidy, can you imagine? But yeah, if you're gardening, you could be paid to be in the garden and you're doing that, you know, when you need to stop and think, you stop and think, but 
uh, it's something that's, it's one of the best business decisions I've ever made. It brings in a healthy amount of income every month for me. My place is consistently really tidy and it gets me outside to go for walks because I'm just, I'm probably more type A than serves me. And so it's very easy to just get locked into the laptop and you're just working all day and then you haven't moved. So for me, it's been a, a lifesaver as well. Yeah, great idea. Thanks, Ted. Um, okay, where did we get to? So that was Esther. Um, the next question is from Jo Byron Russell. And she says she's heard from Lisa Johnson that in the online service provider world, time is often spent 80% marketing, um, content creation, getting visible, podcasts, etc., and only 20% actually delivering your services. Would you agree with that rough estimate? You know, I think it's it's a little more complicated. I would say in the beginning, that's true. But if you imagine like a sliding scale, so like here's 100% of your time and energy. And on this hand is the marketing hand. Well, in the beginning, it's it may be a lot more marketing. But as you, if you're doing it well, when you're doing the hub marketing and you're building relationships and connections and you're really doing a good job and you know you're doing a good job because you're niching and you're really helping a specific group of people and you're getting very good at helping them so they get good results. You see what I'm saying? The amount of marketing goes down over time to the point where there's almost no marketing. I mean, we all know therapists who you can't get in to see them for six months to a year. Your friends rave about them. You've been wanting to get in to work with them. And it's just, we're sorry. There's just no more space or restaurants where it's three months out, you have to reserve. And it doesn't mean there's no marketing. It means the, the marketing game has changed. Um, that the marketing has become, we just give outrageously good service and we really help people uh, with whatever problem they have and we make sure to solve it really well. And we charge enough so we're sustainable. And them being thrilled with the results is the marketing. And yeah, of course you make it to a point in your business where it's for whatever reason, um, a bunch of people move or die or you move or, you know, and, and now you have to market again. Well, that's fine. But um, there is such a thing as a point where it just diminishes and diminishes. But yeah, when you start, nobody knows who you are. And so I would still say be strategic. I would do the hub marketing thing instead of just trying to approach people cold and that can speed it up dramatically. Like this doesn't have to be um, painfully, painfully slow, but let's just imagine it's um, it's three years to get the business solid, and then maybe another three years if if you and this is if you're really niche and really focused that maybe you're just not having to market anymore. I mean, I know a lot of mechanics and plumbers. They, just, they don't even have a business card. They don't have a website. They just are so in demand. But if there was another mechanic shop that opened up, or twenty more plumbers move into town. Now they may want to specialize or they may want to uh, market a bit harder for a while. Um, you know, there's always going to be that. All right, I've got time for one more question. I got to do a puttering session. Okay. Okay. So last question from Ricardo Barreto. Um, and he says, I am an Ayurvedic practitioner. Ayurveda usually attracts a specific group of psychographics and demographics. Even if I focus on the issues, I think my worldview regarding Ayurveda may put off a lot of the psychographics. Is there anything to reconsider to make my niching process work properly? So you can appeal to everybody? <laughs> I'm not sure the question. Yeah, I think that's just built in. Um, your people are going to have to resonate with your point of view. They're going to have to resonate with your approach. If they don't, they're just not your people. I mean, I guess you have two options. One is you can, you can hide the Ayurvedic thing and pretend you don't do Ayurveda, um, never name. I mean, this is genuine. I mean, you could just, you never talk about Ayurveda because you know, I don't know, they're prejudiced against Ayurveda. You just kind of sneak it in, but you, you're, you do what you do and you call it something else as, as a way. But uh, that's probably hard. Uh, and I would just say instead, you say, this is what I do. And you know that will absolutely repel some people for now who may come back a couple of years later saying, wow, I was really stupid. I didn't realize how great Ayurveda was. And I read a book finally. And wow, that's what you do, isn't it? Um, so 
the the idea that we can get everybody that we're not going to turn people off is um is incorrect uh, i wrote a blog post you could probably just search it's on my website it's called get rejected faster you're going to get rejected another one called polarize um it's just going to happen you're going to have people you're fit for and people you're not the key is not to try to eliminate that, but to try to get to that point faster. So they and you both can mutually discern if it's a fit. Okay. Well, let's wrap it up there. Amazing. Okay. Wonderful. This was great. Yeah, great. Thanks so much, Ted. And we maybe we can do this again sometime. Perfect. Let's stop recording then. One more thing. <laughs>